just looking at this picture, we can sense uh, a number of things. First of all, uh, how many things are the same and how many things have changed. We're living in an age of great urbanization, as we know from Ricky's talk uh, yesterday. Uh, more people than ever before live in cities, and we're urbanizing at an extraordinary rate. Uh, we have the rise of completely different kinds of living, and I think we're living in this age right now. Um, but besides all the technology, despite all the changes, many things in our life remain the same. Uh, we are profoundly human. We cannot help ourselves as a collaborative species to reach out to want to be near other people, to engage other people, uh, to be collaborating with other people. Also, as humans, we have a unique gift that no other species has, which is we trade and we exchange. Dogs don't trade in exchange. Chimps don't trade in exchange. This is a profoundly human uh, desire, a profoundly human activity, and this desire to collaborate and the desire to trade exchange characterizes everything we do and it affects uh, even the things that we make, including cities. So in the next few minutes, I just want to talk about how that impacts our life and how we are living through an age where cities themselves are reintegrating uh, to take advantage of the different types of connectivity, specifically related to aviation. Um, in the age of shoe leather and donkeys, uh, cities uh, were like Jerusalem, compact, walkable. Uh, their geometry formed by the relationship of the gateways and markets, all prescribed by a maximum walking distance of roughly uh, up to four or five kilometers. In the great age of sailing ships, you had cities like Lisbon, places like Venice. Even at the dawn of the air age, in this wonderful view with a US Navy airship in the foreground, you can clearly see the relationship of Manhattan, uh, its very busy ports, uh, and the, the interior hinterland. So the very, very close relationship of the port and the city, and the reciprocal benefit of each to each. So the port brought cargo and people to the city. The city created exchange and took advantage of the ports, and they both needed each other. And the port allowed the city to engage over long distances with other cities. In the age of inland waterways, you had cities like Amsterdam. The entire city formed around waterways, bringing people and goods in very, very close proximity to each other to trade and to exchange. In the age of inland waterways, you had cities like Bruges. In the age of inland waterways, for example, uh, from my hometown, New York, you had the Erie Canal, which opened up the hinterland of North America. And out of nowhere, you had cities like Syracuse, cities like Buffalo, that did not exist except for the inland canal. These cities formed themselves around the locks. They formed themselves around the canals. They brought themselves in very, very close proximity to the movement, the transport that allowed collaboration, trade, and exchange. In the age of the railroad, out of nowhere, you had places like, in the United States, Denver, Omaha, Chicago. These are cities that were invented by the railroad. They did not exist but for the railroad. And we can see even now in the form of contemporary Chicago, the echo of the great stockyards uh, of trade, livestock in very close proximity to the, to, the, to the transport hubs. The city wraps itself around the transport hub. The transport hub becomes the city. Even in London now, and I'm a New Yorker, but I'm a Londoner, uh, we have this extraordinary experience. London was a donkeyopolis in, in Roman times. It was a portopolis in the great age of ships. But in the age of railroads, beginning around 1830, you had the pre-industrial city of London. And just penetrating the very, very outer edges, you start to see the great 
uh, railroads coming in, St. Pancras, uh, King's Cross. They're just touching at the perimeter of the city. It's still a wasteland around the railroads, but they are just beginning to bring the hinterland into the city and the city reciprocally into the hinterland. And within 30 years, within 40 years, at the height and the fever of the Industrial Revolution, the city has now swamped its original boundaries. The city is now twice, three times the size that it used to be, and now the city is the gateway. The gateway is the city. In New York City, you had the influence of Grand Central coming into the heart of the city, once the perimeter, and then as the terminal evolves, the city morphs around the terminal, and the terminal engages the city, and even the words uh, become intertwined. Uh, so Grand Central Station being synonymous for urbanity, for civic space, and the, uh, the reciprocal relationship of the transport and the city. With the advent of cars, a very inexpensive energy, unprecedented private mobility, you have the impact, the age of the automobile. And the automobile exploded the city. It um, disaggregated functions, which used to be in the age of the donkey, in the age of the port and the train, much closer together. And it created new forms of urbanism that we really hadn't seen before, disaggregated forms. And it's the beginning of a very, very far-flung disintegration of the city itself. Um, and we start to nibble into the age of the airplane. Um, this, the early airports were city airports, and they were also company airports. So, for example, this is the first paved uh, airport in the world, and it is just outside of Dearborn, Michigan. But what's interesting is actually not so much the paved one way, it's this. This is the first airport hotel. So the first commercial function, almost a civic public function, now installed right next to the airport itself, and starting to create this dialogue, this collaboration between these two types of, uh, of movement and existence. And the idea of integrating the air gateway and the city uh, as closely as ports and railroad termini had been integrated before is not a new idea either. Uh, this is a very uh, enthusiastic man, and he's proposing as an architect to superimpose runways directly into the heart of the city. Uh, as if it was a platter uh, directly over the buildings. Again, to bring people as close as possible to the gateway. So we're now, even as we speak, living in an extraordinary age. Um, the power, the influence of nations is falling away. The importance of cities uh, is increasing. And in the age of nations, every nation required a strong urban core to create the basis for economy and for trade. But in a globalizing age, in an urbanizing age, global cities pull away from nations. Global cities relate more and more to other cities. Cities have always been predicated on trade and exchange. Every aspect of city life that we value, including culture, social aspects is in one way or another dependent on our, on our ability to trade and exchange within the mechanism of the city. But in the age of cities, we're going to start to see something infrastructural that's very, very different. Cities will relate more and more to other cities. Even now in London, as we sit here, we have much more in common with Shanghai, with Sao Paulo, with Bangalore, than we might with Stoke-on-Trent or places to the north. Cities will have more in common with other cities thousands of kilometers away than they will with cities 20 kilometers away. And in this globalizing age of cities connected over long, long distances to other cities, some cities will win and some cities will lose. And in general, the best connected cities win. The cities that have the strongest urban hinterlands to support them win. The cities that connect best to air hubs, other air hubs win. Let's just look at this slide for a second and imagine for a moment that these points all represent different cities. 
Um, if I fly point to point, uh, to every point connected to every other point, I get a relationship that looks something like this. And this is the way uh, trains would work. This is the way early age of aviation worked. This is the way the air system works now. The same number of cities. Every city is connected to every other city, but with a radically uh, more efficient route structure. So you now have something in the middle called a hub. And you can imagine just by looking at this, two things. One is uh, how much movement goes through the hub, uh, but also how much importance the hub derives from that movement. So if you imagine passengers and cargo moving back and forth through the hub, even if they're on the way to somewhere else, they create residual value for the hub. Um, and this is very, very close to this idea that we're going to talk about called Aerotropolis. Aerotropolis is an urban urbanization that forms up around a hub airport. And the vitality of the Aerotropolis is there not just because people are flying to the hub, but because people are flying through the hub on the way to some other place. London, right now, as we speak, is an Aerotropolis. We know this. Uh, all of us firsthand. I live in Camden. I can leave my house in, in probably under 45 minutes. I can be at a gateway in Heathrow Airport, and I can connect anywhere in the world. I have an urban hinterland. I have a good connection, and I have connectivity worldwide. And people who are coming from the United States and are flying to Chongqing or to Bangalore can connect through London to get there. And by the way, if I'm a company, I'm going to set up shop in London because it's on the way to somewhere else. It's a, great, uh, it's a great hub. It's a great place to set up a business. All my work is overseas. I have no work in the UK. I have no work in London. But I live in London, and I think London is a great place because of this. This is an air route uh, from the United Airlines catalog in 1930s. And you can see uh, something very interesting, which is uh, the airlines, the great big trunks, and the byways and the point-to-point -point connections basically just replicated uh, the old railway uh, network, the point-to-point -point networks of the railroad. And these were the point-to-point -point networks of early air travel in 1930. This is the same airline a few years later. Uh, many, many more points, many, many more destinations, only five hubs. This is uh, for one airline, United Airlines. Uh, all the different airlines have a similar structure, whether they're European, uh, American, and increasingly Asian or Chinese. They all are evolving the same kind of hub structure. Um, but you can imagine now the huge importance of the hub. And there's a reciprocal benefit. The hub gives vitality economically and socially to the cities, and the cities in turn support the development of the hub. Why travel at all by the airplane? Why not just use the internet? Every development of technology that's designed to overcome distance eventually brings people closer together, whether it's mail packets, telegraph, telephone, fax machine, internet. And in fact, it's such an accurate predictor that people use internet traffic point to point to predict aviation routes. It's a perfect correlation offset by around five to 10 years. So this is what air travel looks like globally, worldwide. You can make out the United States, South America, Europe, India, and China. China is building, planning to build 100 airports in the next 10 to 12 years. So you can imagine in a few years, China will be as dense as this. Um, and all of these cities ultimately are connecting point to point. How many people in the audience have an iPhone? Raise your hand. This is how an iPhone is made. You have chips coming out of Massachusetts in California. You have chips and pieces coming out of Germany and Europe, out of Asia, different components that are sourced and made in different places and assembled in China, transshipped to Hong Kong, transshipped to Amsterdam, and eventually sold in a store. This is just for one product. And it doesn't even take into consideration all the subshipments of products that went into the original pieces in, in all the different cities. In 2000, 
and seven, 30% of all traded goods travel by air, by value. It's very little amount of weight, but it's a huge value. By the, by the end of probably 2012, this number is about 40% in terms of global value. Global air traffic has been increasing at a very, very steady rate, around 5% per year. And even if you look at the last few years, uh, we know there's been a great downturn in Europe and North America, uh, but it's counterbalanced by the great growth of travel and cargo in the Middle East and Asia, but the still, the aggregated growth rate is still roughly 5%. What happens in the age of energy challenge? Fuel prices double. What would happen to this concept? Well, you have the traditional city, you have the airport, you have in the sort of low density edge city fringe, fringe developments that are now organically in a very ugly way taking advantage of the airport. With the development of Aerotropolis, you have specialized industries that are uh, dependent on the airport, um, that are working very close to the airport, that are still connected by a link to the city. But with the airport city, the airport and the airport city makes the urban center an Aerotropolis. In the age of energy challenge, this is still very important. Long haul air traffic will continue to grow, but energy, the lack of energy, the price of energy will cause urbanization to become more compact, more traditional. So London will become denser. Other traditional cities will become denser, all while at the same time, the airport city continues to grow. The airport city replicates pretty much all the functions of any central business district. Anything you can find in a traditional downtown, you will find in an airport city. Um, and there's no reason why the public realm wouldn't be just as important in the Aerotropolis and the airport city as it would in the downtown. But here are some real economic drivers for all of this, and this is why cities desperately are interested in connecting. Every regularly scheduled long-haul air service creates 3,000 direct and indirect jobs. Seven times more high-value jobs occur in Aerotropolis-type development than in traditional downtowns, particularly in cities that do not have the, the benefit of air connectivity. Every 10% increase in passengers, that includes transferring passengers, not just destination passengers, develops the economy by about 2%. One in six people in the developed world live within 20 minutes of an airport. So you can see if you're in government, if you're a leader, why these kinds of facts are so important and how cities in turn uh, require the reciprocal benefit of the airport. And I just want to end here on an image. This is an image of uh, the proposed uh, estuary airport. Um, London right now is a fabulous aerotropolis. We benefit all from it right now. But Heathrow is maxed out. There is no more capacity. Frankfurt. Paris, Amsterdam are pouring on capacity specifically to take the connectivity uh, away from London and move it to the continent. If we cannot grow, if we cannot connect, if people cannot collaborate with each other, um, we fail. We cannot grow or connect ourselves. If we cannot connect to the emerging market, uh, we cannot grow our economy. So I think this is a very, very important solution. The problem is this is still 20 or 30 years away. So what do we do between now and the next 20 or 30 years? Thank you very much. For more big thinking about the future, go to iq2if.com.